Okay, finally we are ready. Okay, here. Yeah. Then let me first uh, start. Uh, this welcome to this session. This session is for open source DB Azure service on the top of Azure. And then yeah, this is a kind of workshop. So then we will walk through an overview on open source database Azure service on Azure by Brian. And then after then I will explain how you can do your own workshop uh, in 10 to 15 minutes. And then let me briefly introduce Brian again. So Brian works at Microsoft in GBB. GBB stands for Global Black Belt, which is one of very special teams uh, in Microsoft who are specialized in specific technologies. And Brian is an expert on open source databases. So that's why I am <laughs> now having presentation with him. So. But thank you, Brian, for your time uh, for today's session. And then uh, he will explain over, uh, overview on open source database as a service. So I will hand over to him. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Ian. And thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, it's it's uh, I'm in Brisbane, Australia. So it's one o'clock in the afternoon, just after. So good morning or good afternoon to you, wherever you are. And as Ian, Ian uh, uh, spoke about there, Today, I'm going to walk you through our open source relational databases on Azure and give you a, a, an overview of the, the platform features, the how, the why, the where, and the when. And, and hopefully, you, that sparks some, some ideas in your head about how you could, you could take advantage of some of these services and make your life easier as a developer or whatever it might be that, you're, uh, that your job entails. So if, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat window and uh, we'll try to get to those at the end. Uh, and uh, so we'll leave some time at the end for, for a Q and A, but uh, yeah, feel free to pop a question in there if you have one. Okay. Alrighty. So I think uh, just, just to sort of set the scene, we see a lot of, a lot of, uh, shift and in, in momentum towards open source databases. And this is backed up by the usual sort of, uh, you know the uh, analyst firms. So to to set the scene from a from a relational database point of view, uh, we see great growth in Postgres and MySQL particularly, and, and those those are the most used databases by professional developers. So in in conjunction with that, we see a lot of uh, a lot of talk around uh, new applications being developed, and Gartner in fact uh, reckons that by this year. 70% of new in-house developed applications will be will be uh, developed on an open source database. So that's a pretty exciting number, and it, and it clearly shows you that that there is a, a growing trend towards open technologies, not only in in front end development or APIs or whatever it might be, but databases as well. And also Gartner follows that up by saying that by 2023, 75% of all databases will be running in the cloud. So that's that's another another interesting uh, prediction by by them. So that's some serious numbers if you think about the number of worldwide databases. And of course, as no, you, many of you are no doubt aware, Postgres and MySQL continue to win awards for databases of the year. So you know you're not alone in choosing these technologies if you choose to do so. There's healthy communities and and uh, innovation in, in all aspects of these databases. Now I might use the, the term DBAS in, in this, uh, this session, and essentially that's database as a service. So it's kind of like platform as a service, uh, but we, we specifically call it DBAS. Uh, and what is DBAS? Well, you might think about the, the sort of three levels of, of where you can run databases. And you know, this, this uh, picture here shows you that on the left, we've got an on-premises stack, if you like, and in the middle, it's IS or VMs, essentially. And then on the right, we have the DBAS or PaaS option. So what this highlights is, is how much responsibility there is on a developer or a user for the operational tasks. So on the left in the on-premises column, you can see that if you want to stand a database up in an on-premises scenario, you, you can pretty much be responsible, you, maybe not you, but the organization for everything from a data center all the way up to protecting your data and everything in between, including hypervisors and hardware and networking and database provisioning and patching and high availability, disaster recovery, and so on. 
as you move to the right, if you take advantage of VMs or IS, you, your responsibility shrinks a little bit. It's less about hardware and data centers, but you're still responsible for everything, typically from the operating system up. When you move to DBAS, then that shrinks significantly because not, not only is it about the, the platform being uh, managing hardware for you, but we also manage the underlying operating system, which a lot of time we, you don't actually know it's there. Uh, the database provisioning, the patching, the security, you know, the setup of, of daily backups, all that operational, those operational tasks. What's left are applications and data. And that's the sweet spot. And I'm sure that's where many of our people on, on, this, uh, on this presentation today are in, uh, live in that area. So what you can do with, with these, these uh, DBAS offerings is minimize the amount of effort you have to stand up, to maintain, to back up, to make available, to secure your data. And of course, that frees you up to do more with your applications. And that's generally where the value is. Okay, and I'll touch on the support in, in, in a second, all right. So in terms of an overview, all of our, our uh, databases are fully managed and, and in line with that, those, those diagrams that, that I showed there. We use the community versions of MySQL, MariaDB and Postgres, so we're not forking. We're not uh, turning it into something that might be incompatible with where you want to go in the future. We handle the support and, and the liaison with those upstream open source community projects. So if there's an issue with MySQL or Postgres, you don't have to go and, and uh, you know, start to communicate with the community. You raise a ticket with us and we'll do that on your behalf. So it really is a single point of contact for everything. Uh, these databases also integrate with the rest of Azure, especially the, the, uh, the, data, the uh, data ecosystem. And that's in line with their commercial offerings. And of course, we're trying to make these developer friendly so that developers can stand up, migrate, integrate all of their, their, uh, you know, their applications and their, and their solutions with the rest of Azure and take advantage of that, that ecosystem. At a high level, what are the services of the DBAS? Uh, so essentially scalability, so you can scale up and down, compute, storage, etc. We provide inbuilt monitoring, so you can set up alerts and integrate with third-party tooling to do notifications or use our platform notifications. We also we also provide backup and restore. That's part of the part of the service. We do we we have simple configuration to get high availability and disaster recovery options. We do that minor version patching for you, so that's not something that you have, have to take care of yourself if you deploy. Major version upgrades, that's customer managed at this stage. Uh, we also have tools for migrating from anywhere into Azure DBAS for our open source offerings. And as I touched on, we've, we have the integration with the rest of the Azure data ecosystem. And we provide tools for provisioning and automation of services so that you can, you can sort of, um, you know, infrastructure as code type scenarios can be catered for. Okay, now the, the, uh, this slide shows you, you know, sort of a pictorial summary of that. Fully managed, we've got intelligent performance built in, we've got the scale, the availability, control from a, uh, from a configuration perspective. They're all open source. Postgres and MySQL are, are bulletproof open source databases that grew up in the cloud, so that's, that's no different here. And obviously there's a, there's a rich feature set across all of those offerings. Okay, now what I'll do, I'll just touch on some of the deployment options we have, because there's a, there's a few for each different type of database. So for Postgres, we'll start with Postgres. For Postgres, we have four deployment options, and we'll start on the right here, we have single server, which is a cost-optimized sort of de developer entry-level SKU, comes with built-in high availability and all of those features we spoke about up front. Uh, and it is, uh, it's a single noded database, so you can scale it up to, the maximum number of cores for a VM, which today is 64. Once you reach that 64 core limit and, you, and you're, uh, you're starting to, uh, to push that limit, then you maybe got a, another choice to make in terms of whether you try and scale out, or you might look at flexible server, which is also a single noted database. That's the one on the top there. However, it's kind of like the new improved Postgres on Azure. So it now runs Linux as opposed to Windows on the single server version, which gives us more performance. And uh, it also has some, uh, some yeah, better performance as a result of a refresh of the hardware that's, that underpins that service. 
We have uh, enterprise zone redundant high availability, which I'll talk about in later slides. More exposure of the kernel parameter, uh, sorry, the database engine parameters to the user to tune for varied workloads. And we have a custom maintenance window that allows you to fine, fine grain control when uh, platform maintenance is scheduled. We also then go into the left, we also have hyperscale situs, which is Postgres on steroids. It essentially allows you to scale out Postgres. Now this is using a, a open source extension to Postgres, Postgres being an a, a extensible database. The Citus extension is exactly that. It is, a, is a, an extension that you can enable in Postgres and it will then shard or distribute whatever tables that you might want across multiple nodes in a cluster. Now the beauty of this is that it's still Postgres. So in, there's very little application rewrite that is, is needed to take advantage of the scale out capability. I'll touch on that in some later slides. And lastly, we have hyperscale on ARP, which is the ability to run hyperscale in Kubernetes containers. So you could run them on AKS, you could run them in EKS, or you could run them on-prem. And that gives you a bit of a, uh, a hybrid approach to running database, uh, 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 Azure, Postgres, bits, anywhere. Okay, now in terms of the use cases that we see around, around uh, certainly this region, but globally, we see modern transactional applications built with, for example, AKS hosting applications. Uh, and there's an example there of the Finext, Finext uh, offering or the, the uh, application. We see real-time operational analytics, which is another uh, really good use case for, for uh, Postgres and in particular hyperscale. Uh, we see geospatial applications using PostGIS, which again is another extension to Postgres that allows you to take, tap into uh, uh, geospatial uh, capabilities inside the relational database. We see time series data, especially when you've got large volumes of, of time series data. We can, Postgres has partitioning as, as uh, an option, which really helps in those sorts of scenarios. And we've, we also see a lot, of, a lot of organizations choosing to modernize and move away from on-prem or legacy databases such as Oracle and modernize those apps and the data layer to take advantage of these open source technologies. Now, moving on to MySQL and MariaDB, obviously these two need no, no real introduction. MariaDB is essentially the open continuation of MySQL since MySQL was acquired by, by Oracle. Uh, and, and as we touched on before, there's, there's, a, there's a, a healthy uh, interest and, and uh, community around, around MySQL. It powers a lot of a lot of internet websites, a lot of the household names use MySQL databases for their underlying data stores. Nine out of 10 top websites worldwide are powered by MySQL. Now that, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and it's optimized for OLTP websites. Uh, however, we see it deployed in, in many, different, many different scenarios. And you might be familiar with the LAMP stack, which obviously MySQL was, was the, <coughs> excuse me, was the, uh, original database when when LAMP became a common term. Okay, now, in terms of MySQL, there's only two deployment options. So Postgres has four, MySQL has two, and those two are single server and flexible server. Now, single server, same as for Postgres, it's kind of entry, entry level, cost optimized, single node. Flexible server, similar to Postgres, has Linux underneath, better performance, new features, uh, and and uh, extra extra performance as a result of, a result of that. Uh, just before I move on, MariaDB. We only have single server for MariaDB today. The the, uh, the 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 numbers of people that use MySQL on our platform uh, over over MariaDB is quite significant. So I don't think that flexible server for MariaDB is something that will happen short to medium term but watch this space. So for MySQL databases, what sort of use cases do, do we see? Well, for single server, obviously we've got a lot of happy customers on single server. I mentioned that it's, it's got an entry level and cost optimized, has, has high availability built in for free. So that's quite a compelling uh, part of, of the single server use case. Now we see, again, we see online web applications, uh, you know, workloads that don't need the zone redundancy is, is another one. So if, you know, if you just want 
the 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 best sort of bang for buck that can be can be some something for a single server a lot of cloud native applications taking advantage of, of uh, single server flexible server tends to be more about mission critical applications that you can protect with zone redundant high availability and uh, you know there's there's more performance to be had there uh, so yeah those are those are some of the the use cases that we that we see there for uh, MySQL. Now, what is flexible server? So I touched on the single server, which was like the uh, has been on the platform since 2019. Uh, and flexible server uh, was GA in November of last year at Ignite. And as I touched on, it has performance enhancements, and I'll talk about these in the next slide. It has the option of zone redundant high availability, which can protect protect your workloads across availability zones on the Azure Cloud. Uh, we have same zone high availability. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can, excuse me, you can add IOPS to a workload to get more performance. So you might have a small amount of data, but you need a lot of a lot of uh, storage performance, and you can do that now on MySQL. We have that custom maintenance window, newer versions of of MySQL database engine itself. We've exposed more of those configuration parameters to the user, and we've got private access through VNet integration, which allows you to, you know, and not expose your services to to an internet-facing IP address. How did we get those performance improvements in Flexible Server for MySQL? Well, we moved to Linux number one, so we went from container on on Windows to a dedicated VM on Linux, and and uh, <clears throat> these databases grew up on Linux, so no surprise that they perform better on Linux than they do on Windows in most cases. Uh, we've, we've upgraded the storage stack so that, sorry, uh, 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 yeah, we've upgraded the storage stack so that uh, all of the underlying storage is now premium storage. We've also removed the gateway. Now, um, you might not be familiar with this, but in single server, when your application, uh, like in this diagram, when it connects to your database service, which is a container, uh, it talks indirectly through a gateway. It's like transparent, but it has the effect of adding latency to database traffic. So we've removed that with flexible server and you now talk directly to your database. So for, to your VM, so for uh, workloads that are latency sensitive, that, that's proven to be quite significant in terms of uh, performance there. As I touched on, we've got that additional IOPS capability and we've also got the capability to use thread pools to, to manage a, a higher load of concurrent transactions. Alrighty. Now, Moving on to Postgres Flexible Server, again, GA 2021, similar performance enhancements. We've got that zone redundant high availability across both MySQL and Postgres, same custom maintenance window. Uh, we've added platform managed connection pooling to Flexible Server. And previously on single server, you had to manage that yourself. You either stood it up in a container or, or a VM and installed a connection pooler like PG Banser, for example. That's now baked into the service. And it's simply a case of changing the port number on your connection string, and, and you'll be taking advantage of connection pooling and high concurrent user capability. We've also got newer versions of Postgres. So we now support 12 and 13 on Flexible Server, where a single server tops out at 11. And there are no plans to go beyond 11 on single server. So really, I would, I would strongly recommend if, if you want to deploy Postgres on Azure, that you strongly consider flexible server before deploying on single server. And again, the same sort of thing as with MySQL, more configuration of the database uh, from a parameter perspective and private access through VNA integration. Similar sorts of things here in terms of performance to, to get those performance improvements. Linux as the underlying OS, the gateway has been removed, the premium storage. We've also got V4 compute on flexible server, which is a significant performance uplift uh, you can actually take advantage of local SSDs to cache read data. So sometimes the, that uh, that can benefit a certain type of workload. The uh, the PG Banser can also be considered a performance improvement because you can scale more concurrent usage. And as I touched on, Postgres 12 and 13 will offer more performance than Postgres 11, just due to the the uh, the, the uh, performance features or. The, enhance, uh, the enhancements they have made as part of the community releases of Postgres. Okay, so the flexible server architecture works like this. Uh, it's like I said, it's a Linux VM with premium storage. Backups go to zone redundant backup storage. There are three copies of disk 
in an availability zone. That's that's a non high availability solution there. But what you can do is you can, with zone redundant high availability, protect that data. And what we do is we actually synchronously replicate across two availability zones. And what this does is it guarantees that there's zero data loss in the event of an issue with your primary availability zone. So we stand up a standby in, a, in an alternate availability zone and synchronously ship transactions to that, protecting your workload. And we guarantee that with an RPO of zero. So zero data loss in the event of a failure. And the platform manages the failover. And typically, that is less than two minutes. So from detection of failure of the primary to promotion of the standby to be the new primary is often less than two minutes. So that's really good from a, a mission critical application perspective. And that's the same across Postgres and MySQL. <clears throat> One feature that we have on MySQL today that's coming to Postgres is same zone high availability. Now this is the, the most performant because the latency to replicate between two servers in the same availability zone is less than across availability zones. So it's essentially the same architecture, but the primary and the standby are in the same zone. So obviously, if you lose the zone, then you need to fall to your DR solution, but the performance will be better. OK, now what I'd like to touch on is our, our hyperscale offering. And as I, as I mentioned in the, in the deployment options, Hyperscale is a scale-out solution for Postgres. And how it works is in line with this diagram. You, the cluster is made up of one coordinator and any number of workers. Now, we've got customers who have hundreds of worker nodes. Now, each one of those worker nodes is, has its own dedicated, dedicated compute and storage. And so what that allows you to do is get near linear performance increases as you add worker nodes to your cluster. The coordinator node is the connection point for all applications. And so applications don't know that they're talking about a distributed Postgres. Apologies for the dog barking. What happens is as the queries come in to the coordinator node, those queries are distributed across all of the underlying worker nodes. And in parallel, results get aggregated and returned to the coordinator. I think I got that slide the wrong way around, so bear with me. So how do we how we distribute the data in, in hyperscale is it's sharded or in, um, partitioned, if you like, across separate worker nodes. What happens is when you choose to distribute a table and it's at the table level, behind the scenes, the Citus extension will distribute that table to the worker nodes. So it will spread it much like this, this uh, example here where we have a customer table. It will spread shards across the underlying worker nodes. When queries come in to those worker nodes, then this is when the, the query is distributed and, and split across however many worker nodes are in the cluster. And that results in significant performance due to the MPP architecture. Now, it's all DML and EDL is distributed. So when the coordinator issues a command that can that will be sent to all the worker nodes and the coordinator keeps track of the ranges of data that live on each worker node and it's all transparent to the application you're just talking to a postgres database okay we also do shard rebalancing so if you if you add a new node to the cluster to to uh, to scale out to uh, add more performance we have a feature that allows the data to be sharded across all of the nodes in the cluster and, and it effectively does that by moving data between all of the, the workers and rebalancing so that you don't get hot spots on a particular worker node. Now this is non-disruptive so you can actually add compute and storage and performance to the cluster non-disruptively. Okay now hyperscale has it's very similar to flexible server there's actually a couple of nice things about it one is we have a single node cluster available it's called the basic tier that combines the worker and coordinator in, into a single node and allows you to test and develop and take advantage uh, and, uh, and figure out you know, how, how it works and how you can, you can make your application take advantage of that. And then you can scale that single node out to be a multi-node once you want it to go live or if you want it to test in more scale. We've also got newer versions of Postgres, including Postgres 14. You can do a major version upgrade in the portal. So if you are on 13 and you want to go to 14, you can click a button to do that. Now, I would advise testing that in a non-production environment before you do that. Uh, we've got the shard rebalancer. We've also got columnar compression. If you highlight that, take a, a picture of that QR code, that'll take you to 
uh, an article explaining how columnar compression works. Uh, we have read replicas, we have that inbuilt connection pooling, the custom maintenance window, it sounds the same as Flex, like I said. You can change shard keys on the fly, which you couldn't do in the old version. And we've also got a distributed metadata option, which if you grab that QR code, you should be able to figure out uh, that, that that's a pretty cool feature where you can actually talk directly to any node in the cluster. Okay, I think I'm at time. So hopefully that was very useful to uh, explain to you what open source database options we have on Azure. And I'll hand back to Ian and I'll go and see if there's any questions in the chat. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian, for your wonderful talk. And then yeah, there are several questions. So yeah, I, I can also continue my session. Why then, yeah, uh, it will be great if you go to uh, share the notes so that you can see the list of questions and then comment uh, for some of the questions. But I put out so three questions, but for the last question, then I need to prepare my session. So yeah, I couldn't answer, but hopefully then you can answer uh, the final question. So meanwhile, then let me share my screen. So... Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, screen sharing is always not easy. But yeah, I think I'm ready to share my screen. So, yeah, I think everyone can see my screen, right? Uh, Brian, then would you double check? It's beginning to appear as we speak. Yes, we've got a navigation exercise OSS error. Yep. Yeah, thank you for double checking. So my name is Ian, and I'm a developer program marketing manager based in Korea. And I'm working with many developer communities in Korea and other Asia Pacific countries. And then, yeah, I would like to uh, elaborate how you can navigate and exercise open source databases with Microsoft Lab. So then, yeah, you can click this URL. The URL is aka.ms slash learn OS SDB Azure service at dash force Asia 2022. But the URL is a little bit long. So you can just uh, take a screenshot here, or then you can use this QR code. And then, yeah, I will share this URL later, or then, yeah, hopefully, yeah, you can see this URL later. And then you once you click the URL, and then you should go to this page, actually. And then uh, if you go to the URL, uh, okay. if you go to URL, and then you would see that there are a number of resources. For example, let me click this URL. And then yeah, I collected a series of uh, Microsoft Learn modules, which are super great for you to more explore on open source databases as a service on Azure, not only for MySQL and PostgreSQL, Brian mentioned, but also there are great solutions like MariaDB and also then Brian mentioned hyperscale sheetos uh, on open source database for PostgreSQL. And also then I think uh, several attendees are for uh, developers, so then you can also elaborate how to integrate post crash core into your applications like Node.js or any other kind of applications. So let me click this uh, uh, MS Learn module because then it is really easy for you to experience uh, post crash core on Azure for free, even for free. And also that all the detailed instructions and explanations are here. So then Brian uh, kindly uh, <laughs> explained very details but yeah, if you want to see read rather than uh, listen to brian presentation again and then you just go through this ms run module and then you can uh, if you click this exercise and then yeah you should see this kind of screen once you log in, log on on ms run and then yeah this uh launches a separate laboratory for free so that anyone can experience this for uh, for you to experience how you uh, deploy Postgres database server to Azure and then how you can use. So uh, 
I clicked Launch Lab, and then yeah, you, you will see definitely see that uh, Lab will launch in a new window, and then if you click Start Lab, and then such kind of separate window will be shown. So once you see this URL that I already log on, but however, then there is a resources tab. So then you know, first you would see uh, username and password screen on Windows server. So then you can just uh, click this to type username and then click this for password. After then, and then yeah, you can you definitely can see the same instruction as exercise on Microsoft Learn. For example, then when I go to exercise again, and then yeah, the instruction is same as a database administrator, and then connect to the lab environment or and so on. All the instructions are the same on the right side. So then you can read and then experiment. So the first intro, uh, instruction is to go to uh, Azure portal. So I can click this Edge browser and then yeah, it automatically goes to actually Azure portal. And then I already log logged on, but however, then if you see login screen, then you can just click this resources and then you can click username and password to log on uh, Azure portal. And then yeah, you can just follow the instruction. For example, then you can go to resources and yeah, you can type password and also then you can deploy PostgreSQL database by clicking create a resource and then you can navigate a number of Azure services, but you can search yeah, PostgreSQL and then enter. And then yeah, the search wizard will be shown. And then you can click Azure database for PostgreSQL. And then yeah, you can click create. And uh, just one note is that this laboratory is for your uh, skilling purpose or your deploy experience purpose. So then it encourages you to click single server basic, basics rather than flex server server. But then yeah, you can join on Azure portal and then you can also experience flex, flex server server later. So then let me click single server and then yeah, this yeah, I will click, yeah, I will create single server. So I will click and then for resource group and then yeah, it shows, uh, a default resource group, but however, then yeah, time can uh, time can flow and change. So then, yeah, you, you can click just a default resource group, which is already created on Azure uh, portal, and then yeah, you can put server name like PostgreSQL Azure and initial name yeah, Force Asia yeah, like that, and then yeah, you can leave this as default. Yeah, actually the domain your uh, MS Learn seems to be a little bit old, but however, then uh, PostgreSQL open source database is being upgraded. So then you can definitely click uh, version 11. But for competence storage, please click configure plus server, and then you can change to basic. And, as, and also then you can change just uh, CPU v core to one. And I saw some questions on the uh, uh, why Brian was presenting. So then, yeah, how uh, the question was how many databases yeah, you can create? Actually, then there is no uh, limit. Uh, it, it, it is just a limit on PostgreSQL. But however, then for storage or record, then there will be some additional physical restrictions uh, consider due to uh, considering the size of uh, server on Azure. And also then you can click and then yeah, you can type lab admin and password. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like that. And also then yeah, you can click just leave and create and then you can create and then yeah, the resource will be deployed. So then after then you can test this PostgreSQL and then yeah, it is really quick. While then I can also uh, exp uh, briefly explain how you can experience this uh, PostgreSQL. Actually then on this uh, virtual machine, there is a very useful tool called Azure 
data. This is Azure Data Studio tool. Yeah, you should see that this is something similar as Visual Studio Code. Yeah, it's right because and then it, yeah, it is built of uh, using Visual Studio Code open source. But anyway, then yeah, using this, then you can connect to PostgreSQL database once it is deployed. Why then one issue would be that yeah, you need to enable uh, connectivity to connect from this Azure Data Studio to PostgreSQL because uh, it, um, to connect to PostgreSQL, uh, you require a additional network connection. So, but database connection uh, should be uh, managed with high uh, level of security. So, yeah, uh, to do this, and uh, it might take some time. Uh, yeah, ideally, it should be deployed very quick. But usually, then it takes one or two minutes within one or two minutes. So, let's see. Then once it is deployed, then you can just go to the deployed PostgreSQL server resource and then uh, uh, click, uh, select allow access to SQL services and setting yes, and then add this client IP, which is uh, the client IP should be a virtual machine you are trying. And then yeah, you can connect to this uh, database, uh, the database with your, the password you put, and then you can test your query. Uh, so then hope that you can experience uh, uh, PostgreSQL, if you are not familiar, also then if you are not familiar on Azure and then uh, domain, uh, this instruction is really self-explanatory. Uh, so that you can just read and follow and then on the right side and then yeah, you should experience all the things. So let's wait a little bit more. Uh, so yeah. It, it takes uh, a little bit longer than I uh, usually I'm expected. But anyway, then, yeah. Also, then this for Azure uh, Data Studio, and then yeah, uh, you should see the left side on some menus. So then uh, once you click this connection, and then once the PostgreSQL on Azure is successfully deployed, and then you can just add the connection. And also then, yeah. This kind of yeah, problem menu on user Visual Studio should work. So yeah, yeah it is also a open source, so that you can uh, search on GitHub slash Microsoft slash Azure Data Studio, uh, and then you can see the, this uh, repository uh, since it is also uh, based on uh, based in open source. So then you can uh, also download and execute, or then you can contribute to enhance this Azure Data Studio. And currently, then it supports uh, Microsoft SQL Server and Post PostgreSQL. SQL. But yeah, hopefully, then there will be more contributions, and then yeah, more database connection will be supported in future. So meanwhile, then oh, it's still deployment. Oh yeah, deployment is complete. So let's go to the resource, and then yeah, this is a server name, so I can copy. And also, I can paste here. Uh, but as I mentioned, and then you should enable uh, connection uh, on connection security. Then you should add this client IP address for this virtual machine. So I will click this, and then I will also click allow access to Azure services for so the other Azure services can connect to this database. So yeah, this is important because without this and the other Azure services cannot connect this Postgres SQL single server. So, and save, and then it should work uh, very quickly. And then once it is done, and then let me go to yeah, this site, and then also the I pasted the, the server address. And then, yeah, username is, yeah, let me also copy and paste. Yeah, it, yeah, the setting was applied, so I can go to overview. And then I will use admin username right now. And then just right click and paste and password. Yeah. And then, yeah, I will uh, leave database name and address as default. And then I will click connect. Okay, the connection was successfully uh, managed. 
and then yeah i can click database and then i can i can see uh default three databases and then i will just click postgres database and then it also supports a kind of notebook format uh, if you are familiar with uh python and then it, it uh, this is very similar as um, jupyter notebook so then you can uh yeah execute a query like select from information data, schema data, eh? and SQL features. Yeah, let's let me execute this query, and then select run cells, and then yeah, it should run. Okay, yep, the query is successfully executed. Yeah, it is managed a kind of uh, not, uh, separate notebook, so you can save and manage a number of queries separately. Yeah, this is the, uh, this feature seems super great because uh, most developers are now familiar, especially for Python, the open source co contributors are very familiar with Jupyter notebook format. So then, yeah, you can manage a number of um, uh, uh, queries and then your own executions through this notebook. So yeah, this once you finish the exercise and then you can click done. And then yeah, lab is complete, and then it goes back to Microsoft Learn, then you can uh, answer the quiz. So then yeah, hopefully yeah, you can uh, answer all the quizzes, and then yeah, uh, once you that uh, once you finish, and then you can unlock this module, and uh, so then you can complete this, this module. Like this, and the on cloud skill challenge, there are a number of great modules provided. So you can also experience other great Microsoft Run modules. And but today, then I just focus on how you uh, uh, experience Postgres SQL on Azure on MS Run. And then hope that my session is useful. And yeah, this is the end of our session. And so hopefully, then you can more learn and explore and your own learning path with Microsoft Learn. And then, okay, and then I'm now going back to the present, uh, presenter mode. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, Brian, are you there or, yeah? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, great, great. So now then it's our training time. So I'm wondering then, uh, uh, would you want to comment from some of great questions? Yeah, look, I've answered most of the questions along with you, Ian, in the chat. I don't, I don't see any unanswered ones there. But does anybody have any further questions? I think there was a, a f uh, for that first question, uh, Ian had suggested that you might wish to comment, Brian. Okay, so how many databases? That one. Yeah. Yes, yes, Brian. Yeah, OK, so look, so the, there's no real practical limit. Are you talking about, if you're talking about instances, like you can spin up as many instances as you want, but within an instance or a service, you can also create databases. Like in Postgres, you can create 100 databases or 1,000 databases. The, really, what, what the limitation is is the amount of storage underneath. Uh, you could spin up as many as you wanted. Same for MySQL, you can create databases or schemas. And, and there's no real, real sort of practical limit. But uh, yeah, so I think uh, you only pay for the one service. So if you have five databases in that, it's still the same cost. Sorry. I, I've never tried pushing uh, either database towards its limits, but I assume, at least in my experience, the problem has been as much uh, the provisioned IO capacity and the provisioned CPU and RAM as it has the uh, total amount of storage provisioned. But, but yeah, I've never okay. seen a reason to say no. You can't make more databases. I mean, you always make more databases or more sure. tables or whatever. I think I think we, we had a customer who asked about more than a thousand a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the response was yes, you can do it. I mean, obviously you'll reach a point where you like you are alluding to their Roland, is you might reach a point where it, it, it stops working from a capacity point of view. And the other thing I would say is a best practice, rather than, for example, having a single 16 core database instance. It might actually in sometimes be better to have two eight cores and maybe have like test and dev on one and and prod on another. And the reason for that is obviously you get that separation of compute, you get independent storage, 
You also get backups at the entire instance level or the service level. So if you want to do a restore, you, you, you'll end up restoring all of your data, only if, even if you only need a little part of it. So, you know, things like that. And to avoid the noisy neighbor syndrome where, you know, you've got a dev database inside a, an instance along with prod and somebody's trying some new code, writing some queries, and that query uses a lot of resources, whether it's I.O. bandwidth or compute, that might negatively impact the the neighbors. So uh, there's, no, there's not really a good reason to put too many in, inside the service, but obviously it depends on, on your, your use case and just be aware of the potential pitfalls, I would say. What's, so uh, perhaps extending the other way, I mean, I absolutely accept the, you know, uh, scaling out horizontally does automatically limit the, the potential for one uh, poorly optimized query to flatline the service for a thousand other clients. Um, what are the upper limits? For, this is more for a question for analytic workloads than for transactional, which I admit is not perhaps what Postgres and MySQL are best for, but what are the upper limits in terms of uh, core counts, memory counts, and IO per second? So when you talk about uh, scaling out, Roland, that's know, scaling, scaling, scaling up. What, what are scaling the limits up. for scaling up? Okay, so today it's 64 cores on both Postgres and MySQL Flexible Server. MySQL will have 80 cores available within the next quarter. And, and in, terms of, in terms of storage, they're limited to 16 terabytes today and 20,000 IOPS. And RAM? RAM is kind of like linked at sort of like five five gigabytes per core roughly per so core, right. if you have okay. a, yeah if you have a 64 core postgres memory optimized then that'll be almost half a terabyte of ram so it'll be 504 gigabytes i think so pretty hefty i mean i don't see a lot of customers who actually use more than 64 cores there are very few analytic workloads that would be uh <laughs> challenging that and, and frankly if you're working at that scale you start applying big data principles anyway and you, you chop it into smaller pieces so yeah that exactly and it's, yeah, it's something I, I would have touched on in the presentation but it's obviously i had to get it into uh, 30 minutes was that hyperscale actually has an htap capability given that scale out nature of hyperscale situs you can actually run htap hybrid transactional and analytical processing on the same data set because you've got an MPP cluster, you no longer have to worry about a, a large query affecting all of your compute resource. So what we've got a lot of customers who combine that, that sort of OLTP and reporting or analytics on the same data store. Now, one of the real benefits of that is that you can get away with that ETL. You, you know, like you don't oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I've, Commercially, I have reason to do this, where uh, the, the ratio between uh, Sort of loading activities and query activities is unusual and consequently uh, avoiding etl into some sort of warehouse is desirable but it's it, either at our scale it, it, you know it's 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 eight, eight cores 16 cores maybe you know the, the idea that we'd get towards half a terabyte of ram with 64 cores or 80 cores is not uh, not something we'd normally see so i That's yeah i think it's a useful capacity to have um yeah. but it's if you're getting, if you're starting to touch the edges, then it, that's probably a sort of clue that maybe it's worth. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. From yeah, great. From Rwanda, Rwanda saying that I would like to comment that uh, still, then I see that many customers in Korea and also the other Asia Pacific countries uh, are using on-premise open source database by installing by themselves. But in reality, then managing such open source databases is not easy. Uh, installing life, is life is too, life is too short. Life. life is too short. I, I would much prefer outsource it to somebody who's automated it. I, I, I have no interest in in paying administrators to do that stuff. Uh, you know, on a sort of custom basis, it, it, it makes no economic sense at all. Uh, so no, I, you know, the the fact that I can go to Azure and pay for an hour's use of a thing that I would never be willing to build. I, I, that's fantastic. I have no, uh, <laughs> there's nothing to sell yeah. there. But there was yeah. one other really interesting question here. Um, and I, I acknowledge that we're now probably going to step outside of strictly OSS, but it's, it's perhaps of interest to others in the room. So I will uh, expand a little on uh, Goodeep's question. Uh, are there any, uh, call it serverless or sort of paper query type database offerings on Azure? 
Yes, yeah, so the, from a relational OSS point of view, there aren't, but that may be coming. However, Cosmos DB does have a serverless option. So that's obviously a, a, a no SQL database, uh, yeah. but it's- it has typically no because they, they, they scale more sensibly. So I, that's sort of to be expected. Yeah. So, so it's actually it, a pros and cons. Yeah, there are a number of database solutions. So then, yeah, this uh, open source databases currently uh, on uh, available on Azure are for uh, the open source uh, database users, previous users like MySQL or PostgreSQL servers and uh, users, and also the Flex server server is really great because then yeah you can also remove some kind of mind share on you should also manage a number of cores, what are core limits like that. So yeah, this is also great, and so. Uh, I'm also uh, have been using uh, Cosmos TV for, for serverless, and then yeah, it is a kind of some mind share difference between when, when you think on database and also then yes, like three tier architecture on web server or some middleware uh, database and also then serverless architecture. So hopefully then yeah, more audiences can experience more on serverless architecture with uh, Cosmos TV, which is also super great. It, it, I mean, the same uh, shift in thinking has had to occur for serverless uh, app containers anyway. It's, it's you know, you, you're thinking about the problem in a different way to switch to a serverless mindset. And I note that uh, Postgres and MySQL haven't gone there yet. So it's uh, the fact that, and it's not just Microsoft, obviously the, there are other uh, uh, PaaS providers or DBAS providers who are, whose product lines end up with very similar characteristics that there's a sort of service like option that is not uh, open relational. So it's a, uh, I just wanted to expand sort of good answer to say, um, <laughs> there is a way to do it. Uh, it just sadly and at present and embarrassingly, it's not available in open source. So that was the, but it, but it is available from Azure. If, if, if a developer is in that situation where that's the right way to move forward, then uh, it might often be a, an acceptable compromise to have all of the stack open except for a uh, serverless database engine, which is not, so long as non-relational or NoSQL is acceptable. That's uh, that yeah, seems to have cut all. Uh, recently, she uh, the last question: and yeah, where can we best use Postgre database where than other RDBMS? Yeah, yeah Brian mentioned they yeah, are great answers like OLTP, HTTP, uh, also others. But uh, I also would like to point that yeah. In reality, then there are a number of RDBMS users for uh, who are uh, who have been using Microsoft SQL Server. We are usually say MS SQL, uh, and uh, which is based on TSQL. And also, then some users are still using Oracle database. And then yeah, those they are uh, their skills are very accustomed. So then yeah. Uh, for the users on Oracle uh, database, and then they are exploring also the PostgreSQL database <laughs> very well, uh, which is supported on production. But why then they are worrying with the management issues on open source database? So then for those users, then they are uh, considering PostgreSQL database very well. And then I also saw then some customers moved from Oracle database into a PostgreSQL database. So hope that such kind of uh, insight is also useful. Yeah, that's an interesting one, Ian. One of the, one of the key things, one of the key uh, sort of factors in that migration from Oracle to Postgres is that their procedural languages are very similar. So if you have a lot of PLSQL code, that transforms fairly readily to PLPGSQL. And and uh, so that can de-risk migrations because you know, it can be it can be a simpler migration and there's a familiarity from a developer perspective as well. So I mean when you look at the TCO of Postgres versus pretty much any commercial database, you you know it's a huge difference to the bottom line and that's driving a lot of the adoption. Plus people don't want to be locked in. I think that's the key. The key trend is people. Well, I, I don't I don't want to go into another service. That, that means I'm in the same position. Well, yeah, welcome to thank you. <laughs> That's why we're here. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, interesting and informative. Uh, we, uh, yeah. Also, thank you, Ronaldo, for your great moderation, okay, <laughs> especially.